Focus Venture Fund based here in New York City, but we invest throughout the country in leading enterprise startups. Key to our model is a heavy focus on corporate engagement and community, and it's through numerous conversations with Fortune 1000 executives, as well as leading startup founders and operators that we use to inform this report. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. First off, we're gonna have chat open throughout, so please share any feedback and questions as we go, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Please know that this webinar is being recorded, and we do intend to share it afterwards. And today's webinar isn't meant to be exhausted. After all, there's 121 slides of enterprise goodness in here. What, we do, what we're seeking to do in this talk is really cover some key trends that are important to different members of the team, and we're always happy to do deeper dives if you reach out to any of us on the team as a follow-up from today's webinar. So with that, let's kick off. We thought it would be helpful to set some macro perspective before diving into tech trends. It's truly a brave new world out there in the enterprise. In the early 2010s even, on-prem still ruled the world, and the new guard, who we affectionately call the Rebel Alliance, for all you Star Wars fans out there, figured out a way to use the flexibility of cloud to change the game and outcompete the old guard empire. If you look at the landscape today though, not everyone is a stormtrooper that can shoot 100 laser blasts and somehow miss every single shot. The Empire is still active on-prem, but there's been a ton of new competitors that are way more nimble between growth guard companies, many of whom have over 100 million in revenue, managed to still grow quickly and expand their product suites by the day, paired with the mega clouds, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, who manage to every single year and their annual cloud events kill off tons of startups with different feature announcements. In short, it's never been easier to start an enterprise company, but it's also been, never been harder to differentiate and scale. As we look at the M&A landscape, incumbents like Microsoft and Salesforce intend to maintain their dominance through some pretty hefty M&A. Admittedly, we didn't see things like GitHub acquisition coming, but it's a true game changer for Microsoft as they continue to reinvent themselves in the cloud and open source era. Given the cash that all of these mega clouds and other large tech companies have, we can expect a lot more activity. We had a little bit of fun as we were going through this report and uh, we're speculating. We wonder if Salesforce will maybe get bought by AWS or Google, really to undercut uh, Microsoft and the Dynamics play. Microsoft, as they continue to be acquisitive post GitHub, Okta looks like a really nice target to have in sight to own enterprise identity. We're gonna jump ahead now, and my colleague Vipin will discuss trends on machine learning. Hi everyone, this is Vipin. I'll be covering our section on machine learning. It's been an area of intense interest within our corporate network. Um, so as John mentioned, we host these uh, quarterly peer roundtables connecting executives solving some of the largest tech, point, tech pain points facing their organization. At our machine intelligence roundtable a few weeks back, it became clear that ML and AI were the most significant initiatives this year, and most of the attendees were actively building supporting infrastructure. Priorities included navigating build versus buy scenarios, hiring data science talent, avoiding vendor lock-in, and really figuring out their cloud strategy. From these conversations, I've been really interested in understanding what ways enterprises can leverage the data that they have to create systems of intelligence that improve their business. As a founder building a startup, it's really hard to compete with the clouds. And although, open so, uh, although software may be eating the world, we've since mostly passed that transition and moved on to open source software, which has really gained a lot of steam within machine learning itself. As you know, data continues to grow and more than 90% of data out there was created in the last two years. There's serious value that can be unlocked in this data for massive efficiencies and even save lives. But a huge problem is that there is a shortage of data scientists to really make sense of it all. And it really comes down to a key question that is often being asked, how do we use AI and machine learning and data science to get better at what we do? It's really hard today to really think about this at an organizational level. Why is that? Because a lot of companies like Google, Facebook, and Netflix are scooping up the talent, that uh, top data science talent, 
um, to work on their products. And although executives are bullish about AI, a lot less believe that they'd get anything done in 2018. Nonetheless, a lot of forward thinking organizations are really starting to gear up and do it. We're noticing three main models that help enterprises uncover insights on the data that they have. One is hiring data scientists and building out a centralized data science group to help deliver insights to the business. Two is citizen data scientists using GUI based tools to deliver those ML insights without the data scientists. And three, business users using ML models through tools like Data Robot. Data scientists are a unique breed. They prefer tinkering and using open source scripts versus the GUI based ETL tools of um, the previous years and previous age. Again, that AI talent is scarce and you can't really find enough um, engineers here um, on either end of the spectrum, whether they're data engineers or machine learning engineers, it, it's really hard to try to create an org a centralized organization that helps do that. But we do think that that's the right strategy. Um, it follows a model similar to mobile as it hit the enterprise in the past where you can matrix out those people, those uh, employees into various business units. And uh, we, we think that that's going to be a model that continues to grow over the next few years. As uh, data science models get deployed in production, scaling them is really, really hard. And so we've been spending a fair amount of time understanding all of the different aspects of the data science process within a larger company and trying to understand what so a patchwork of solutions fit there so that companies can actually leverage them. Part of that process, we put together a landscape of vendors that we thought really highly of that are really starting to break into the enterprise in a lot of different projects. And one of the, you know, the way we've organized this is really from the, the process of collecting the data, understanding it, making sense of it, and applying a model on top of it, and then deploying it into production. Data scientists generate a lot of their value a lot later when they apply predictions and really try to figure out what it means for the business. And even though a lot of data scientists go into work, make a cup of coffee and try to figure out try to figure out a discovery for the business, a lot of that time is actually being spent cleaning data, trying to understand it, and really trying to transform it into a format that's actually usable for them. I'm going to jump through the next few slides so that we can cover our section on cloud native. But I think one of the key things I want to touch on here is there is the infrastructure out there. Uh, there needs to be a proper infrastructure to do AI at your organization. And all of that is still being sought after and being built out. And part of this, one thing that we kept hearing over and over again um, through our machine learning roundtables and machine learning executives is around productionizing data science models. And this is an extremely hard task to do when you have over 10 models that are live in production. And that's mainly because these types of workloads are very different from your typical um, you know, server workloads. And they're extremely spiky and it's really hard to manage them at scale. You do need infrastructure to support it and it's really hard to build that in-house. It would take tens of engineers and over a year to really iron out that AI pipeline process. We've made an investment in a company named Algorithmia that helps do exactly this and it's starting to gain great steam across various industries like pharmaceuticals and financial services and retail companies. Again, I'm gonna jump a further into um, more of our cloud conversation and uh, cover that so that we have time for um, other areas. So on cloud, AWS is definitely unquestionably the leader given their timing and execution advantage. Azure though is somewhat close, is a close second depending on how you look at things. And even though that might be debatable, um, you know, even though this thought might be debatable, Google is, uh, in my opinion, 
even though they're third and, and lacking in market share, they have the best and most promising long-term strategy. We've noticed that Microsoft had that biggest leap in their position this year, and they are starting to gain some steam within enterprises. Another, another key thing to mention here is vendor lock-in is a very real uh, fear within every large company. I used to work at Bank of America in the past, and I used to help prepare reports for our IT leaders ahead of their meetings with vendors. And the number one thing that we'd always look at uh, from a vendor perspective was that fear of lock-in. And avoiding that in the long term was always core to our strategy. Again, even though Google is significantly behind, they do have some sophisticated infrastructure and a lot of mind share in the cloud native space that's starting to gain steam. Um, one of the key learnings through our uh, infrastructure roundtables is that everyone has, is busy developing their multi-cloud strategy. This is of intense interest and Although we're starting to see some people really execute on it, and three different models are coming up here. One is the mono cloud model, where you choose one single provider and go all in. Either People usually focus on Amazon or Microsoft here. A really good example is Barclays and Moody's, uh, sorry, Barclays, uh, that is completely all using AWS and has plans to move over. The next model, um, even though we call it the price broker model here, it's really cloud native. It's being able to run your workloads wherever they are cheapest to deploy and using tools like Kubernetes to deploy those workloads most efficiently. The third is um, picking and choosing a cloud for different capabilities. For example, you might use Google for your AI and data pipelines and AWS for either cost or general compute. We believe that going cloud native is really the only way to avoid vendor lock-in and maintain flexibility as you continue to build on your infrastructure and grow that practice within your company. One of the key things that enabled, enables cloud native is really the advent of containers. And I think Docker really popularized the notion of the container, which has been used across internet scale companies for years now but is just breaking into the enterprise. And orchestration is a key enabler of that. And, and one thing that we have saw early on through a lot of different conversations with executives in our network is that Kubernetes is really gaining steam as a way of enabling for that type of flexibility. And today, I would say that you know, Kubernetes is now being viewed as a de facto way of deploying containers at your organization and there's a lot of, even though Kubernetes is still a little hard to understand and hard to grasp and really hard to implement, and we're seeing next-gen tools making that a lot easier, but it's still a lot of work and there needs to be more innovation happening here. Again, enterprises are now using containers in some, some capacity. Um, four years ago, um, that was still super early days, and now, what we're seeing is that there are now teams that are being built more agile in their development uh, strategy. And we're, we're actually starting to see folks actively using and building uh, containers in their environments. Again, this is just another slide on Kubernetes adoption. Uh, it seems as though containers and Kubernetes are going hand in hand. And you can kind of tell that you know, it's pretty telling with Docker's strategy of supporting Kubernetes as well. The service mesh is definitely also an area that people are talking about. I still think it's super early days, um, but Istio seems to be the approach that most companies are interested in and looking at. Um, we go a little bit further into what a service mesh is um, and different predictions around that. Um, but I think one of the key things is that this is still super early. It does solve a lot of problems and security is one of the biggest features for a service mesh. And being able to identify and understand where your server workloads are running, what's what, is also a huge problem. Spiffy, the Spiffy project is actually really interesting here and covers some of the bases. 
um, for being able to do that at scale. We've been extremely interested in this whole notion of site reliability engineering. It's one of the ways that you can actually manage the uh, cloud workloads that you have running and make sure that your services are always up. Um, it's, it's a so core set of practices built by Google to understand and triage issues as they come up and prevent them in the future. And this landscape has several different categories like monitoring, alerting, ticketing, performance management, and logging. But we really think that there could be workflow tools that help bring that culture of SRE into the enterprise. And this is really hard to do at a larger organization, mainly because today there are a lot of silos and existing ticketing systems that make this pretty difficult. But there's still a fair amount of opportunity and an interest in doing this. We're starting to see some corporations build out their first SRE teams. And these are the SRE teams that look more like cloud SRE teams. Chaos engineering is also emerging. And even though this whole category of chaos engineering is new, the, the discipline of stress testing environments has always existed at larger organizations. For example, a lot of the banks, um, the IT leaders there, um, some of them have really made a name for themselves whenever they were able to craft a system that failed over in the event of an outage. And so this is a practice, a discipline that is completely familiar, but now being uh, rejiggered for the cloud world. We have uh, several other sections on observability, and I'm not going to cover serverless uh, today, but it's, 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 we just believe it's, it's super early here. Um, but we're, so, several of our companies, for example, like Algorithmia, are deploying ways of doing serverless um, for specific use cases like machine learning. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kelly Mack, who's going to cover our section on cybersecurity. Hi, everybody. Uh, for those that I haven't met yet, my name is Kelly Mack. I'm a principal here on the Workbench team, and I focus on our security investments, as well as lead our corporate engagement network. Uh, further, uh, prior to coming to Workbench, I used to be at Forrester Research, where I covered the security market, primarily in security architecture and operations. So for our um, kind of too long didn't read or didn't listen, um, the next few slides are going to cover um, three main concepts. So the first one is that the chief information security officer isn't the only buyer. Uh, in fact, we're seeing uh, the VP of infrastructure or security engineering or cloud engineering being that new champion. We'll dig into this a bit more, but what we found in the corporate conversations we've been having is that Instead of always aiming for the top in the security organization, a target approach to roles is important. Um, so for all the security startups out there, it's not always necessary to uh, find the CISO of an organization in order to sell to them, but kind of ground roots approach to the middle management is, is, uh, is the right way to do it. The second thing that we'll cover is that security engineering teams are leading the shift with built-in security rather than bolt-on. This is actually um, security engineering is leading it, but is really a, a full scale security organization effort where we're seeing a lot of CISOs rationalizing their security budget and uh, technology stack where the more and more they can uh, reduce the amount of technology in their organization and leverage the infrastructure security available, the better. The last thing is that security go to market is riding the open source wave and we'll touch on a bit of that later. So I'm going to quickly go over these slides. I think a lot of folks are pretty um, familiar with the security market and how frothy it's been. If we just look at 2017, we've had 552 deals at a uh, combined total of uh, nearly $8 billion or $7.6 billion. And what is actually really telling is the second slide from CB Insights that shows that for first time investors, 27 was a big year. And uh, this is directly correlated to uh, you know, how uh, saturated the security market is. And it's something that 
for us as investors, we're super attuned to and want to be thoughtful in our approach to investing in security technologies. Some of the major categories that we've been seeing on the investment side um, just over the years is the cloud access security broker market where, you know, right now there only stands one uh, private player, Netscope, still um, kind of sticking around with the other folks, CloudLock, Elastica, Scott, and Sky High most recently to McAfee last year, uh, having already been acquired. So we're keeping a, an eye on the market for Netscope to see. Um, we're predicting that perhaps in the near future, they will either go public or get acquired. Another thing super interesting is the uh, uh, excitement around the security orchestration automation and uh, response market. And so folks like Phantom have been acquired uh, by Splunk for a massive amount and Hexadite uh, a couple years back as well was acquired by Microsoft. Most recently, Demisto also received uh, a big amount of funding. I actually, actually think it was uh, announced earlier today. So the automation market is hot, but I think that the real kind of gap that exists in the security operations space is a focus on triage analytics, um, which folks like uh, uplevel, simplify, and JASC uh, tackle. When we look at GDPR, um, there are a host of many tools out there that seem to leverage the GDPR brand as a marketing, uh, as a way to get marketing eyes, but we're seeing that the tools that really focus on the technology approach are getting the most adoption and interest. So now to the exciting stuff. As I was mentioning before, the, the CISO role has been changing um, and it's been focused a lot more on business outcomes. What I mean by that is focusing on managing risk, developing policies from that risk, but also managing the compliance. When it comes to technology decisions or understanding of those technologies, many times it's a notch below that CISO, whether that's the um, person that leads endpoint security or the, or the person that leads network security. So for security startups out there, it's always best to uh, um, kind of shoot for the person that is most directly re related to the uh, kind of concepts that you're working on. And also, as I uh, kind of touched on earlier, the importance of a uh, kind of rationalized approach to security where um, startups aren't always kind of chasing where infrastructure goes, but is uh, um, kind of smart in their approach to how CISOs would actually manage this within their environment. An important piece for us that we've been looking into is the security engineering organization. What we mean by this is with the importance of DevOps for the security organization to insert themselves into the uh, DevSecOps process is important for what we've been seeing a, a kind of a shared service group of engineers that sits between these two organizations. Um, we're seeing this being done in a couple of ways by either an application developer or operations person upskilling themselves to understand um, and focusing on the security element or a security engineer kind of upskilling themselves and learning a bit more and get, just getting closer with the application development folks. A big reason for this, as Vipin mentioned before, is the big rise in microservices. Um, and I'm not going to touch on you know, too much on the microservices point, but given all the changes in infrastructure, the closer uh, that you know, security teams can understand how, those, uh, how the infrastructure is changing and uh, be uh, teammates in that change, the better. For us, we've been looking a lot into the built-in security approach. In this case, security engineering organizations as they're working with infrastructure and application development understand that there are tools that they use within, internally to make this happen, whether it's HashiCorp or Sysdig for monitoring. So for us, we've been uh, evangelizing the approach of infrastructure, infrastructure tools with a security um, benefit. When we're looking at the microservice market, um, there seems to be three camps of companies. On one end, uh, on the left side, we have identity companies focusing on making sure that these workloads, wherever they live, um, have a particular way that you can identify, authenticate, and then authorize the policies in which they operate. 
in the middle middle uh, section, we see many companies focusing on the network runtime monitoring or hardening, whether that be for containers or serverless or um, VM environments. And then the last one would be for log analytics of just understanding all the logs that come out so you can do measurement uh, and management. But for us, one of the core concepts is the importance of identity and being that essential first building block for microservice security. When we talk to a lot of corporates, they're always super attuned to what many of the big players in the web, uh, big web scale players do, whether that's Google, Netflix, Slack, et cetera. And the, those large web scale companies have contributed uh, a great amount to the open source security community, whether that's Facebook's Collide or um, all the work that the Netflix folks have been doing around uh, eBPF. And so we're seeing many different uh, companies commercializing these technologies and helping these large organizations actually start to use the open source tools in a meaning more meaningful way. The key takeaways here, as I mentioned before, is that um, the built-in approach just makes a lot more sense. And, and in doing so, uh, targeting security engineers is the, the best uh, kind of buyer and champion for the work that you're doing. Open source is a great marketing tactic for enterprise security and um, the more and more communities are being built around these open source security tools, um, uh, the better. And then lastly, for a lot of the InfoSec startups out there, um, CISOs are a lot more business focused, but we're also seeing many CISOs from non-traditional roles, whether that's coming from um, um, government intelligence or et cetera, where it's not kind of longstanding uh, security uh, CISSP mindset, but kind of a new approach to doing it within their organization. Thanks, Kelly. We got John back here to wrap up with our decentralization of SaaS section. This section actually led to some of the most clickbaity titles uh, in coverage by the press saying that Workbench decries that SaaS is totally done for. Uh, let's be clear here. Companies like Salesforce and Workday power the Fortune 1000 these days, and the old adage of you don't get fired for buying IBM is probably more applicable to people like Salesforce in terms of job stability these days. To unpack what we're getting at though, in the early days of SaaS, it presented freedom for massive contracts with the typical 20% annual maintenance fees. Over time though, they used their ease of adoption to build hooks into different business logic and that meant that they became indispensable to large corporations. The same way that companies of the past had that 20% annual maintenance, these new SaaS companies actually took advantage and started upcharging 30% a year on these annual SaaS contracts. Additionally, they each had custom business logic and different APIs to use, and that led to millions of dollars being spent with different providers. The key takeaway of this entire section is that in the early days, everything was on-prem and infrastructure, the massive clunkiness of it led to people like Mark Benioff and Salesforce and others using the flexibility of the cloud to get people off and start people using cloud software. The pendulum is going to swing the other way. And as you see here, if SaaS eat infrastructure, cloud is now going to actually eat SaaS is our prediction. And what we mean by this is that infrastructure and dev trends, things like containers, microservices, serverless, are gonna change the game and power tremendous digital transformation for the Fortune 1000 over the next five to 10 years. Another important takeaway is when we look at the deep software customizations that led to millions of dollars in bills, and 12 to 18 month deployment cycles that Accenture, Deloitte, PwC, frankly, minted money off of, we do think that this paradigm is gonna change because if things benefit from containers and microservices, there's more of a, so to speak, common language, you're gonna have less proprietary tooling that requires less experts. So in the future, we think that simpler customization can be done and will be done by internal developer teams. The big challenge here for the Forge 1000 is that for software to truly eat the world, 
a lot of these old guard Fortune 1000 companies are going to have to figure out how to recruit and maintain their talent bases and excite them with modern uh, development challenges while still keeping some of their legacy environments intact. So this is a trend that, as Vipin alluded to earlier, when we speak to infrastructure leaders and development leaders at different Fortune 1000 companies, they're being mindful of in terms of legacy apps. Do they decommission them? Do they lift and shift? Do they purposely just rebuild things from scratch? And this is an area that excites us a lot to track closely. So for anyone on the startup or corporate side, please reach out. With that, we're gonna to come to an end for the webinar portion and would love to answer any questions. Do we have anything in the chat? Uh, just as a reminder, the chat is open and you can type in since we don't have uh, call in options for your voice, but uh, we'll answer anything if you have a question here. I know we have a bunch of people on the line, so don't be shy. Feel free to ask away and we'll, we'll answer. Cool, so with that, uh, I see that there was a little bit of healthy dialogue in the chat, so thanks everyone for participating. Oh, excellent, we do have a question. What is your prediction on edge computing? Do you think with IoT on the rise, edge will take over the centralized cloud? That's actually one that we were following edge last year. Admittedly, with the slow adoption of a lot of industrial IoT technology, we have not been tracking as closely. Uh, so that actually is a great question. And if you email us at the Workbench team, we can follow up with you on that. Someone is asking for a link to the slides. If you go to work-bench.com slash blog, uh, you can see our entire report there and download it. Oh, excellent. All right, we're starting to get some questions. So how are you seeing startups reaching the new champions inside the enterprise, i.e. as the CISO shifts? So this is something that really Kelly Mack on our team leads for all our corporate engagement work. So Kelly, you wanna chime in? Yeah, I'd say that the way that we've been doing it, so as a, as a venture fund, we uh, take a heavy, uh, we put heavy value on the corporate engagement network. What that means for us being in New York City, uh, many of these folks are just a subway right away. So we establish relationships with the CISO level, but we make it a point to uh, map out everybody within that organization, whether they're focused on security architecture, whether they're focused on network security or uh, endpoint security. And just kind of through those relationships, um, at least for us as, as a fund can you know better help with introductions. I'd say for the kind of advice for startups, many of this it can be done um, kind of through conferences. Many of the um, folks that are within these uh, kind of leadership positions, um, it's sometimes if they're kind of publicly speaking, many times it's kind of like the best way to approach them there. But I'd say um, just understanding that those technology buying decisions are with, within those folks' hands and not necessarily at the CISO level. It's always best to kind of, um, kind of direct yourselves towards them rather than waste your time at, at, at higher level executives. There was also another question on time frame of hybrid cloud and service mesh adoption. So this is still super early days, but as I mentioned earlier around multi-cloud, this is definitely something uh, that, is, uh, that is being researched and strategized on today. Um, I, I don't think that the uh, tools are yet broadly available. Um, you know, we're, we are starting to see a lot of interest in, in around like cloud native as a kind of ecosystem that's forming. Cloud Native Con, for example, and KubeCon is actually a really great place to kind of see and learn more about some of these emerging tools. A lot of them, at the end of the day, are still just being created. And so we will probably see, you know, in terms of true time frame, you know, I, I would be, I would, I think some of the early adopters are more forward thinking. We might see some uh, 
uh, adoption next year and, and the year after. But it's this is still super early days in terms of be, becoming something that most companies can rely on uh, to orchestrate their workloads across different clouds. On serverless, um, you know, it's it's definitely something that I think more startups talk about than corporates. It's not, you know, something that we're really getting a sense of uh, that is of interest. It, it more than that is really like an interest in the service mesh that can help solve for security and identity challenges, um, and even help with their multi-cloud adoption. But it's still pretty difficult there. Around um, issues deploying machine learning models in production. Um, so there's a question about, can you say more about requirements? You said 10 engineers are required. Can you dig a little deeper? Um, so based on our conversations with various data scientists, uh, one thing that we've learned is that once you've got several models deployed in production, um, anywhere between five to 10, the uh, the difficulties in managing it become a lot harder. So you're dealing with um, you know things like auto scaling, um, packaging them in, up into containers, um, monitoring them, being able to see you know who in the organization is using them, and you know I I would put some parameters around like you know if you have ten to twenty data science models or even. 10 data scientists, you definitely need a, the proper infrastructure to help manage that entire process um, and be able to deploy at scale. And so, um, you know, there's new tools that are popping up. One that, you know, we're invested in is a company named Algorithmia, which really, you know, takes the AI infrastructure uh, of places like Uber and helps you bring that to your organization for your data scientists. We'll take we'll take any more questions if, if you guys have it. So the last question that we have here is around the industrial IoT market. And, and uh, so it was mentioned earlier that they move, uh, operate rather slowly. And it seems like many different companies are trying to attack this space. What we've identified is that um, many of these organizations, when it comes to their technology environments, it's, they're hesitant to uh, adopt new technology, um, despite the fact that uh, they know that it's necessary. And this is a mix of uh, kind of that industrial mindset, as well as the kind of fear and un not understanding whether or not these types of technologies can help. And so uh, definitely uh, been seeing, at least for ourselves and, and some investments we've made in the industrial sector, that it is a little bit of a, of a longer take. But with that in mind, we're seeing a, a little bit more uptake with things that operate with the service model, given that, that trust and um, that kind of trust and an understanding of the understanding of the business helps move that needle along a lot farther. And just to add a little bit more color here, it, it definitely has been surprising. But if you look at the way that a lot of these companies have operated, whether it's manufacturing, oil and gas, there's a lot of margin pressure that these companies in the public markets face as they have to meet quarterly uh, earnings requirements. The infrastructure requirements that often need to be made in order to use a lot of IoT technology requires a more long-term oriented growth mindset. And unless you have the CEO and the board really behind that and communicating that to the public markets, it's hard to justify these investments. You also have to realize that they might not always be the most sophisticated IT buyers. So when a company comes in with a Ferrari engine that can do preventative maintenance, sometimes they may be good with just a lower class engine from a car and they may not be able to even fully utilize given their staffing some of this modern technology. Uh, we do have a company in the space that's doing incredibly well called Alluvium, and the way that they're thinking about this problem space for uh, providing a stability score for industrial operators is by 
offering via really a SaaS delivery model these insights and analytics to provide this stability score to industrials and it arms operators. Instead of trying to cut them out and use a Silicon Valley mindset of, hey, we're just gonna build all these machine learning models and, and replace you, it's actually all about arming them and augmenting their intelligence to respond quicker and act quicker. Uh, having said that, it is difficult in this space to go to market as a whole, and uh, we've actually been talking to different private ex equity executives who own some of these companies given just the nature of some of these industries of IoT adoption, and we're starting to see more uptake there because they are taking that growth mindset and be willing, and they're willing to invest uh, what's necessary. Another question is on how do we see pen testing evolve? So we've seen pen testing evolve in a couple of ways. One of them was, uh, I'd say the kind of crowdsource model with Synac and a bunch of others. One of the latest kind of ways that we've been seeing is just through um, kind of the automated approach of um, either from within of uh, the breach simulation tools or um, from, from without, but um, from, I mean, from the outside, but I, I guess in this case, given the uh, kind of higher adoption of these breach simulation tools, seeing that kind of whole space of risk transform where um, everything's crowded around, uh, whether it's third party risk management or uh, cyber risk quantification, that's, uh, you know, everybody's trying to approach the next gen GRC in a, in a, in a new way. Got time for a couple more if anyone has any other uh, last burning questions. I do see a question I think we missed regarding 5G. Admittedly, uh, in our conversations with corporate executives, we haven't heard that come up a lot yet. Uh, but I would say that over the last few months, people like Verizon and Sprint are looking to start getting the word out there, really to in the community-driven mindset, because one of the keys they're trying to stress to us is that 5G is going to unlock net new use cases, just given the sheer bandwidth and, and things like that. So it's something that if we have to estimate, probably like January, February onwards, we'll start seeing a lot more engagement from the corporate community around that. We're actually planning some different events on that exact theme at Workbench in 2019, so definitely stay tuned for that. Alrighty, so I think with that, we're going to call it. Uh, this is the first experiment of this kind for us at Workbench. We really appreciate all the engagement in the chat. We want to thank you all for uh, dialing in today to participate with us. We'll share this, uh, this recording as a follow-up afterwards. And if you're a startup working on anything in the enterprise, please reach out if you're a corporate executive uh, interested in learning trends deeper that we're learning about and seeing and also just pure collaboration opportunities. Uh, definitely reach out to us via email and Twitter. Thanks so much and have a great day, everyone.